we're going to do is we're kind of doing difference in difference part part two redux. Um, wanted to cover a little bit more from what we talked about last time, which will be I'll kind of use as a launching pad to get into these synthetic methods, which have been become become more common. I am I I don't know if I want to say that they are common empirical methods, but they're extremely popular for people to study or research in um, econometric space. So um, let's get into it. Um, basically, what I want to do is I want to talk, I want to finish basically the conversation we talked about last class regarding difference and difference and focus a little bit on this conversation of what I'll call event studies, which is really what I want to be focusing on is kind of this problem of event studies, which is this idea of how it's generating a counterfactual control unit. Namely this idea that, you know, really what you should have in mind in almost all these panel style methods is that because we're estimating the average treatment effect on the treated, right, the ATT, in those cases, well, we always know what the treated outcome is and what we need is some control unit or, you know, can average control value. And so this point that comes up in these event studies is who is the control unit? And sort of all the problems that are kind of raised in these papers are about, well, you know, there's this kind of logical incoherency of how counterfactual kind of control units were chosen. And once you do that correctly, things are pretty straightforward. Um, and then I wanna kind of use that to talk about synthetic control methods um, the synthetic control per se has been around for 20 years, but when I was in graduate school, it was kind of more of a, I want to say like a curiosity, um, and now has become more of a thing, potentially in part because of the upswing in machine learning. Um, so let's start with this. So we're going to start by talking about a kind of event study. So um, if you read these papers on this topic, the distinction between event study and difference in difference is not really a formal distinction. And we sort of, people use these phrases backwards and forwards. I'm gonna propose, you know, you can choose to believe this or not and go forth and and spread this gospel if it, if it is um, useful. Is that like an event study approach, one way to think about event studies is that a lot of times in when people are using this kind of approach and what has created these issues is it's like, a, staggered intervention so you have differential timing right it's not like i have some papers where i'm like well all these things happened in 2008 or the tax example from um the yegan paper was like in 2001 there was a tax reform that's like a one-time intervention if you have staggered interventions there are a lot of cases in which there's a staggered intervention in which everyone eventually gets treated there's no real never treated group and so that happens in many places right so um, an example that I have here on the right is from this paper by Dobkin et al. Um, it's Dobkin, Finkelstein, uh, Noto, and I want to say Klunder, um, which is about hospitalizations. And so the data set that they're using is people who are hospitalized. So you see them, it's kind of the sampling process as you see people come to a hospital. You know when they come to a hospital but all your units are people who are hospitalized eventually. You can see backwards and forwards, but your sampling process by definition generates people who are at some point eventually treated. And so you don't have a pure control per se. So that I think is potentially a useful distinction to at least keep in the back of your mind, whether or not you wanna like spread this as gospel that event study means that there's no pure control. That is like crucially though, something you need to pay attention to. And I think like is, the crux of the matter, if you're gonna take away one thing, thinking about diff and diff is like, what is my control unit um, in this setting? And more specifically, is there a, a pure control per se? Um, so one thing that I wanted to kind of highlight from a pure practicality standpoint is that without a pure control group, you and you have this staggered implementation approach, this is, um, a lot of times you'll run a regression that looks like the following. So just from a pure implementation standpoint, let's talk through this. Cause I think, you know, if we want to talk about the nuts and bolts, this is how one would do something like this. 
So what you'd say, so let's actually use the example on the right. So this is from a AR paper 2018. Like I said, what they what they have is there are people who have been hospitalized. So some event, uh, presumably like, it's not like you had an inpatient thing, like you're getting surgery. It's like something bad happened. Um, and um, what happens is, so something happens and they have this data sample where they see when it happens. And what they've done is they've linked this to credit report data. So this is an outcome from credit report data. This is collection balances. So if you know my research, this is, I'm very, I'm picking things that I know. So this is very uh, near and dear to the sort of stuff I work on. Um, and what they've done here, there's a number of things going on in the background, but let's focus on the dots, is they have like monthly data. They have monthly data um, where what they're doing is they are estimating the effect relative to some base period on collection balances before and after hospitalization, right? So there's an event window, there's an event that it happens, and then they're estimating relative effects before and afterwards. And so the obvious benefit here, right, was that they could see kind of, they could see whether or not this made sense. So uh, kind of intuitively an assumption was that there really shouldn't be an effect on collections before hospitalizations, if it's truly some random thing that happens. And then you'd sort of hope that there would be this effect subsequently. Um, the kind of key point in the setting, and hopefully this is clear in the back of your mind, is that what's happening is that the comparison that's being made is remember, they don't have anyone who's never hospitalized. So if you're estimating an effect, let's look out 36 months after the fact. That point estimate has to be estimated using basically the relative comparison of somebody who's 36 months after hospitalization relative to whatever the base you know, omitted time period is that they're hospitalized. So it, I believe that they did T equals minus four in the sense that like four, four months beforehand, but regardless, some pre-period where they're comparing relative to this pre-period. So what they have to be doing is they have to be comparing people who are going to be hospitalized, but they're just comparing before, like across different time windows. So really another way of saying this is showing you the actual event, um, but what it is, is um, if you think about it, if we just had these two groups where what's happening is it looks something like this, here's the first time it happens, and here's the second time, is you know these people, say these people were going, let's do it with different colors, if we're feeling ambitious. If, um, if group two was kind of going along, you know, group two is going along and then eventually they're gonna have something go up. Well, what happens is, is that group one goes up earlier. And so when they're here, the relative comparison is being made relative to these people when they don't go up. Is that clear to people? Sort of the idea of what's going on? Can you, sorry, I know it's, maybe it's too far away. My, my uh, space will switch excuse me, to this other one. Is that clear, potentially? Great, okay. So now there's lots of hospitalizations happening and a large number of windows in which this can occur. But kind of the key point that happens in this setting is that if you have average baseline level differences, so these unit fixed effects here. And so actually in their paper, in the main version of it, they don't have a unit fixed effect. They include that subsequently. But if you have level differences between the groups, which would be something like um, this, right? Where what you need to do is normalize. Well, obviously you have to then be, you have to omit a time period. You have to omit the time period in part because you need to be estimating um, relative to some baseline group. That's so when you include an alpha I, you have to omit one of the time periods in the estimation. But the second thing that happens, and this is specifically in these staggered or in intervention windows, is that if you do this fully saturated model, the, the, the dynamic specification, you have to also exclude some periods outside of this window. So I specified it here from L0 to L1. If we have a full time set of time windows that we can estimate over, you have to um, omit 
some subset of the of the time periods in which you can estimate it. So to make this concrete, you know, imagine you have a fully balanced panel. So you have, you know, it's it goes from uh, p equals one all the way up to two t. So it's fully balanced, so everybody can see it. But interventions happen at different time windows. Well, then the maximum minus that it could be, right? So if the event happened here, you can go all the way back to minus two, well, two t minus one, and all the way forward to two t minus one, right? That's sort of this. You can have an event happen right here and go all the way forward, or you can go backwards um, th this way. This is the event time, and in the event time. The trick is, is that you have to exclude, if you want to think about it in this pre-period, you can't estimate all the time window um, relative to the estimated effect. So a lot of times what people do is they exclude, they pool or they exclude um, dynamic portions in the pre-period. They basically fix all of these equal to zero. You estimate the effects here, then you estimate the effects go forward, and then you pool the values um, at the end. Is that, let me pause for a second. Is that clear? Like, is this confusing to people or is this sort of clear what's going on? I always find this kind of looks like magic when people do this because, but the, the key issue that shows up in this setting is that what's happening is that there's co just collinearity. You just can't differentiate the effects of what's going on. There's an event time trend. There's a kind of a calendar time trend. And then there's like a unit fixed effect and all three of those together, you can't fully saturate everything. I do it on the next one. Um, is really this thing of like, you have to pick a pre-period and I think, you know, a baseline when you have these fixed effects. And that I think makes sense to everyone. You just, you're normalizing everyone to be the same. And then um, you need to have these excluded ones because of the calendar time um, collinearity with the event time. The, yeah. Um, the necessary assumption this is in this Son and Abraham and also this Calo and um, Santa Ana paper is like, it's similar to what we talked about. We already talked about this. It's like parallel trends, quote unquote, is the necessary assumption. But kind of the key point is like amongst who or amongst whom maybe is the right, grammatically right way to say it is. And, and in the Abraham and Son paper to get this right, to be able to do this kind of thing is you really need parallel trends to kind of be all the same, to not have any issues with this. Unless you want to have full homogeneity, you need that all the groups to have kind of parallel trends. So I kind of showed you one example here, but then imagine you have a bunch of them. And you can pretty easily imagine that that's not going to hold. So parallel trends, remember, is not inherently a testable assumption. You can partially test it by looking at stuff in the pre, like the observable pre-trends. Parallel trends, remember, is if you were going to recite it, if she was tattooed on your arm, which for a while it should have been on mine, is like in the absence of the treatment that the paths would have evolved in parallel. So it's a, it's a counterfactual statement. So it's not inherently something you could see, but there's obvious good reasons. Like if you're thinking about the counterfactual path of states during the crisis versus during the boom. So thinking back in the 2000s, Right, state they're just like the effect of treatments would have looked different in a boom period than they would have looked in a bus. So in my own work, they would have been very implausible to imagine that the paths are super, super similar. Um, so, you know, the idea here is that it's kind of what Sun and Abraham point to this, is this Journal of Econometrics article is that like really it's the heterogeneity in the treatment effects that cause all the problems. And this is true of basically every paper I've described to you over today and, and on Thursday last week was it's head, it's allowing for kind of unknown heterogeneity, which unfortunately exists in the world, that causes this potential issues of these event studies not um, estimating what you think they're estimating in the sense that these heterogeneity treatment effects can cause it to be such that um, you'll do a version of this graph. So this one on the left. And a lot of time people will do this with confidence intervals and look to see if they're different from zero. And the Sun and Abraham paper, what they're basically stipulating is that because of heterogeneity in the, treat in the treatment paths, 
that there can be basically contamination that occurs in the pretrends just by the way that this two-way fixed effects estimator is, is run. And so to not have that, you need to effectively use the only the late adopters as a control group and not use them as a treatment. And so then the point is, is that when we pool them together and run this regression, we're trying to get an overall average. And what we'd like is it to be some weighted combination, like it, for example, like in the Callaway um, and Santa Ana paper. Um, but the, the point that they're highlighting in this is that without strong assumptions, it's going to create issues. There's going to be this contamination. And then they propose a solution, which is very similar to the Callaway and Santa Ana one, which is to say, use future treated groups as your control. Like you have to specify what your control is. Um, that's really this point is that the late adopters are the control group. Um, so, you know, in this setting here, uh, or, or rather here, what would happen is, is that you can fix all of this if you just said, all right, I'm no longer estimating the effect for group three. I'm hold, I'm, and I'm not going past the time period for when group three is, is affected, right? So what the time when group three comes up, that's the end of my sample. I'm, no, I'm just using them as a control. And I'm gonna assume that their parallel trends hold between group three and group one. And then I can estimate that effect. I can do the same thing for group two. And then I do some weighted combination, which is exactly what the Callaway and Santa Ana paper is doing as well. I mean, I don't wanna say that they're doing exactly the same thing, but my impression is that these all are the same idea. They're different versions of the same idea, which is that what is the control group? I mean, that's, um, yeah. So any questions on that? These are totally good questions. I think like, I mean, so actually this is a paper of mine and I will maybe this is like as a way of it's like a mea culpa or showing you that even as I'm like six years after my PhD and I'm clearly learning that I was doing some things like not as correctly as I could have. So this is a paper I have, it's published um, where what we were doing is we were looking at event flag removal so we were like, um, we had credit report data, bankruptcy flags are removed from your credit score. We were using that as our event. So think of that as like the event, there's obviously staggered timings. We have different cohorts, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna talk about what's on this slide in just a second, but just so that this is clear, this is the event time, right? So chapter 13 event flag removal was what we were focused on. So here's, it's this orange line. You see there's this jump in the credit score and deterioration. Um, there are kind of a number of things we could have done. So what we could have done is we could have looked at exclusively chapter 13 filers and done kind of the staggered timing, right? Which would have been like a version of the event study version, which would have been staggering. What we did instead was we constructed a control group using chapter seven bankruptcy filers. So that's this blue line, um, which we argued was a good um, kind of factual. The, the key thing is, is like, you know, we used exactly the setup that they caution us against using. So we clearly, I'd love to go back, you know, when I'm not busy, which is never, um, to go and like check how much this matters or some of the things. They are clearly composition effects. Like part of the point we make in the paper is that there's very interesting differences in the mortgage results that we find in the 2008 period versus in the, you know, in the boom, like, Obviously, you might imagine there's different credit outcomes. And so the averaging there might be off. And we published this paper like a year, like this is all relatively recent. So this is very new stuff. But um, I think, and, I, and so just to give you a sense, like the zeitgeist of this is that I think people vaguely understand this, but it's, it's a really natural way to set up the regression and the kind of non-parametric way, which we've talked about over the course of this course, which is like, Here's your treatment group, here's your control, like do some weighted combination, get an average. The problem with that is a lot of, it doesn't spit out, for example, like what your standard errors are. And so a lot of times people gravitate to doing the regression, which is fine, but the key trick is that then you need to be really aware of like what combinations you're doing. So just as a caution, like this is, I'm just as guilty of doing this as anyone else. Um, this is the aside that I wanted to say here, which is especially for folks who maybe do more macro stuff or you are doing finance things or this kind of short run aspects. A question about like what you want to do or like what group you choose to use at it, like is this idea, I was emphasizing this point of like, what's the counterfactual is like, you know, 
sometimes there may be things that were just aren't palatable, like parallel trends, you're just like not willing to believe, for example. Um, sometimes things are more palatable though in very short windows, for example, like really the parallel trends assumption in a local sense is the idea, and we're gonna get into this, is that the change in the control group, right, the non-treated group, that you can use that to kind of approximate the change in the treated group, right? It's this idea that you can linearly, you can kind of extrapolate using that control groups change in that local period. And so one way to think about this is just like the extreme version is you could say, you know, one extremely short run counterfactual is just a linear extrapolation. So this is from that paper for a robustness thing. We had a referee ask this. And so we, what we did was we said, okay, well, let's just, Forget, say you don't like our different diff. Well, what you can do is you can see, well, what would happen if we just took a line and we fit it to the, like, right what happens beforehand. And we use that as our counterfactual. So we assume it, we're assuming this really locally linear conditional mean function. And then we're extrapolating it forward one period. The unfortunate problem is that you can obviously see is that the issue in our setting is that at year seven, a lot of other things get removed from the bankrupts, um, from the credit report simultaneously. So what's really great is the chapter seven kind of moves in a meaningful way. Whereas if you use just the line, you already are getting an underestimate of the effect because you're kind of extrapolating it forward. Um, anyway, the point is, is that you, know, you can use this to kind of think about like, how far forward do I really need to estimate an effect? If all I care about is estimating something super, super, local, like what happened in the last two months, you know, that's a, I can maybe make much weaker assumptions there um, if I'm willing to impose some kind of smoothness result. Any questions on that? Okay. So my assertion, at least, I mean, this is not totally fair, but the issue in the event study where you have really no true control group and part of the problems that came as a consequence of that is this kind of attempt to get a free lunch in the sense that you kind of always need to specify like who's controlling for whom. And in the end, like if we kept that last adopter, for example, the person, the group that last finally got treated, if we're using them as a treatment group, well, then implicitly, we had some very weird control group for that particular, we were imposing some kind of symmetry. And so, you know, just ignoring that was kind of being potentially um, not sufficiently careful. So what's helpful here is to think about, you know, go back to the cross-sectional setting when we started and we said, we were interested in the average treatment effect on the treated, the ATT. That's typically in these regression settings, what we're capturing. We're capturing some version of the ATT which is that, you know, remember it's the, it's what we're doing is, let me just write this out again. I, I meant to do it on here, but what it is, is it's the conditional expectation of why I won right? That's, that's the ATT. If you don't have that burned into your brain, so remember that because di is equal to one, it's for the treated group. We know this piece, like that piece is literally just the data. Like we don't have to worry about any counterfactual piece. So this is known. And then the trick was always this question of, well, how do I get the, how do I get the untreated average conditional on being treated? You know, the, the people who are treated, how do I know what their value is? So it's this imputation problem. So this is always known. And then we always had to get some sort of unknown value there. And basically, <laughs> this is maybe a little too strong here. This event study approach has had issues by kind of ignoring this point and hoping regression would solve the problem. Maybe that's a little strong is it was potentially not thinking carefully about what the counterfactual was that was going into YI zero. What's notable is that because of the panel structure is that if you, if you have full homogeneity, you actually can get it back out 
the correct counterfactual. Just because of this linear approximation, when you have no heterogeneity, when you have full homogeneity and that all the things are the same, you end up, it ends up working out fine. And that's in part because of just the fact that you can, um, there's not really any averaging that has to happen. You can kind of just exactly nail down what the treatment effects are. Um, really what we have to have happen in these panel models, this so the event study model, is that to get the ATT is we need to be able to construct a counterfactual. And to do that, we need parallel trends to hold. So the reason for that is that if we think about, you know, why JT untreated, so this is for the control group, you know, the relative change, that needs to be a good approximator of the, um, basically what it would look like in the treated group who, um, it went, if they were untreated, basically what would happen in the absence of the treatment. And because we have this underlying parametric assumption, which is that we have this, um, these double, this two-way fixed effects, we have the, the unit fixed effects and the time fixed effect, that this first differencing basically makes them good approximations for one another, right? So we know that if we take the differences, that one approximates the other extremely well. That's kind of the, the point is that this is constructing this counterfactual. And so the idea that I want you to take here is that, you know, this two-way fixed effect approach was imposing this linear, very specific linear factor model and backing out this, um, being able to back out this counterfactual. Well, now we're going to kind of try and generalize this idea a little bit. And this is what this synthetic control and synthetic difference and difference literature is trying to do, is trying to basically push this as, as sort of as far as it goes. And I'm going to give you, I think, at best, it's kind of a high level version of this um, in, in a view of this. So, you know, think about the following. So rather than imposing the parallel trends assumption directly, you know, we could be saying, well, let's construct a combination of units to approximate the counterfactual, right? So that like in the cross section, that's what we were doing. We were saying, you know, we had this constructed unit, the Y hat zero. We were weighting them up by say P scores. And that's how we were getting kind of some average that was gonna correctly approximate um, the, 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 the counterfactual, the control value for um, the treated group. And what it was, right, is we were taking some sums and the way that the weights would work, the way that we'd pick which ones to weight up is that we would reweight based on comparability to the treated group, right? That's what we were doing with P-score, right? Is we had X's in the treatment of the control group. And we said, look, we have the treated. And if we want to get them comparable, we need to kind of condition on P-scores so that they look similar. And now there were obvious issues in the sense that we were worried that the treatment was kind of um, confounded in some way. There was some unobservable. But if we had strict ignorability, the idea was that we could can use P-score methods effectively to weight things up. And the idea in synthetic control methods and more generally these synthetic methods is to say, well, if we have panel data, maybe we can use pre-treatment data to think about the way that we're constructing these weights. And then of course, what's gonna happen is, is that we're, um, the argument is going to be that if we assume some kind of underlying factor model, that, that these are going to exactly pin down the right things um, in each particular setting. So this is kind of one of the canonical um, synthetic control approaches. Um, so this is from, uh, I should have put his co-authors on here. This is uh, Abedi, Diamond, and I think Heinmuller is the third co-author from their 2010 JASA article. Um, they have a couple articles on synthetic control. This is one of the more recent ones where um, they're considering the following problem. So in 1989, California banned smoking. So this Proposition 99 passes, which basically, um, uh, it, it bans basically sales of, I'm trying to remember the exact stipulation. Of it. it doesn't ban smoking altogether, but it substantially reduces basically the ability to smoke in California. Um, 
And so the question, you know, the causal question you might have in mind is, well, what would have happened in California in the absence of the ban? Like what was the effect of the ban on smoking in California? So that's a very local causal question, right? In the sense that this is very specifically a question about the causal effect on the ban in California in the post period um, relative to some counterfactual or where they hadn't imposed it. Now, this is obviously super valuable in the sense that you'd still like to know this. This is a true fact that would be informative about the value of bans, but it is useful to point out that, and this is gonna be true of most of the synthetic control literature is that this is very much like a case study, right? This is to some extent saying like, what is the impact in California? And so the question of course is, well, what's the external validity of this? Let's say this method I'm about to tell you works, is it generalizable to other settings? And so the, the short answer is gonna be no, not without some stronger assumptions. Um, and more generally, these synthetic control methods are really about particular inter interventions where you're gonna estimate the effect in that one place. And then hopefully that's gonna be informative of a broader set of things versus in the diff and diff approach, we had in mind that this was being informative about kind of the average effect within our population. We could potentially even talk about population um, impacts if we were willing to um, account for uncertainty there. The kind of the story here is that what we need is a synthetic California. So this is the language that gets used here. It's kind of, it's, I, it's very slick. Um, we need a synthetic California as our control. And in an ideal world, this is almost like the diff and diff world, right? Is the average of the other states would work. So this graph here is from their paper on the right. Um, in the black line is California. You can kind of see, you know, you take the simple average of the rest of the United States. I believe this is population weighted. Um, it's not really obvious. If I showed you these and then I was like, look at how big the difference is in California five years later. It's not obvious to me that you all would agree with me, right? You would say, well, okay, maybe. Um, but you could sort of see it though, but I mean, to be frank, right, is like uh, the year before the proposition, and then there's this kind of this really much more steep fall off. The inherent problem is that there's all these underlying things going on. You have no sense to which is causal. So, what do you, what are we gonna do? So, what we're gonna we're gonna come back to that. Don't worry, I'm gonna tell you the answer of what it looks like. The answer is the smoking ban did reduce smoking. If you were wondering. Um, what we're going to think about is a setup in the following way, which is that we're going to consider the following general problem. And this is, I'm using the setup from this Dudchenko and Imben's paper from 2018, which I find really nice. Um, but I would recommend you guys go take a look at it if this is something you're interested in. Where, let's consider the following problem. So what we have is a panel with T time periods and N plus one units. And we have an intervention at some time zero for a single unit. So we're really gonna be focusing until we get to this broader setting, we're thinking of these kind of individual treatment effects. We have one treated group um, and we're gonna think about trying to construct a synthetic counterfactual for that. And we have these potential outcomes, we have some treatment that happens and we only observe one of the potential outcomes. As usual, we have this fundamental problem of causal inference and we can potentially even have um, fixed characteristics. And the key idea is that this is this um, absorbing state treatment. So many of these applications, they're really not gonna allow these things to switch back and forth. It's kind of like you get treated, you're treated indefinitely. Um, it doesn't turn off. It, turn, it creates these kind of block, these block matrices when uh, you're thinking about estimation here. So the potential outcomes, yes. Okay, I already said that. So. Now what we're gonna do, so notationally, the way that I'm gonna think about this, I'm gonna be following their setup, is that the way to think about the data now is that we can think about the observed Y data as, write this out um, so that you have it. Almost, it's on the slide, but I, I wanna add some, if I had an iPad, it would show up on my iPad, which is that we have this Y matrix switch the camera one second we have this y matrix here which is made up of these four four terms so the y is the outcome 
where what we have is we have these are this is observed data where we have y in the post period for the treated group so t here stands for treated not time i'm really sorry about that that's you can take that up with keto not with me um and then we have the control group in the post and in the and the control group in the pre the key thing is that this is n plus one it's y and then there's t time periods right so it's, it's long this way and the idea is that there's one of these guys there's n of these guys and then there's um potentially i mean you can think of it as one time period or there's many time periods and this is split up into the pre-period and the post-period any questions Does that make sense it's kind of it's like very nice you can notationally set things up to be similar for the covariates. I'm kind of going to ignore the covariates. Um, the Duchenko and Inben's paper kind of does as well, in part because the outcomes are so much more predictive. But um, so, you know, to estimate this post effect. So, oh, yeah. So the kind of the key thing here, and this is kind of the key thing to pay attention to is that this is kind of a missing data problem is what we have, right? So what we have is that in the post period, what we see for the treatment group is we see the treatment value. And then for the control group, we have the control version. And then in the pre, we have the um, untreated for both of them, obviously. So what we have is you can think of this as almost as being two matrices in the sense that for this, but the key point is that for this guy, we don't see the version of the post value. You need, and what you need to construct is you need an estimate of yt post zero, right? So if we had yt post zero, if we just, a simple way to think about this is like, what if we just had across the cross section? So if DIT were randomly assigned, we wouldn't even have to worry about the panel stuff, right? Like forget about the panel. If DIT had been randomly assigned, we would have just estimated stuff in the cross section. We could use the panel stuff for maybe for bat, like checking balance and, and doing more um, fancy stratification. But if it's randomly assigned, we would just construct the YT post zero using P-score or regression methods or anything else. And without random assignment, um, one can use covariates to match this, right? Like if given I told you we have covariates, there's no reason inherently you have to use the panel. The reason we use the panel is that we're kind of really motivated difference and difference really said, okay, well, if we assume a particular parametric form like this linear additive um, structure, that what happens is that by using linear differences, we would get rid of these unobservable pieces. And so, you know, there's a question of, well, is there something particularly special about this linear additive structure? Um, the short answer would be sometimes, you know, that maybe models in which you can write down where it's additive linearity is a meaningful assumption, but it, it's also possible in other times where it's not. So um, remember basically what the uh, Duchenko and Inben's paper basically says that you know, estimators of this counterfactual can be boiled down into these, uh, into this very simple kind of formulation, which is that there's this constant term mu, and then there's this weighted combination of the post groups outcome. So it's, it's really, it's, you know, using the eyes that are in the control group, their observed outcome, and then weighting them up in order to get this. That's a lot of the estimators are basically following versions of this approach in order to get particular weighted functions. So, you know, constructing essentially a synthetic, in synthetic version. Um, so, you know, just to get this back into the world that we've seen already, the a constant mu, right, would be allowing the averages to be very different. So it's allowing the idea that what you could have is, um, two things that are on very different levels, right? So you'd have one that's down, uh, one that's you know, a mu, uh, an average of 10 and the other one is an average of 25 and all you're allowing for like a, a sharp difference across the two, which is uh, extrapolating a little bit. Um, that's basically 
very common in difference in difference. Um, you're allowing for big differences across the group. Alternatively, you can have, and so the issue there, right, is that like if your treated group is a, a really big outlier, that's good to have this constant because you need to kind of, if it's an outlier relative to your control group, it's very challenging to kind of match the baseline averages across the two. Um, the second thing is that you can allow for these weights on these omega i to vary across i, right? So if you, if omega i was equal to one over n, that would be difference in difference, right? When I do the really simple version of it, you would have, you'd be subtracting off, you'd have the average here, and then you'd maybe have some constant that would be like the baseline average um, for uh, uh, the, the treated group. So now what we can talk about is, well, we understand how difference in difference works, but we kind of also see that there's a lot more other ways that one could approach this. And so we can talk about potential generalizations in this setting. So the synthetic approach, synthetic control approach from the Abadi et al. paper, what they do is that they impose some kind of substantially stronger assumptions um, in this setting. So what they do is first, they impose that mu is equal to zero. So they're not allowing for these, these averages across the groups. Second, they're imposing that the omegas have to sum up to one. So this is imposing the idea that the weights have to add up to some constant one in this, in this case, that's putting it um, inside. And then importantly, they're adding this non-negativity constraint to the weight. So really this is the summing up to one plus that implies that there's some convex hull that it has to be inside of. So this counterfactual has to be constructed within the support of the counterfactual groups, which is usually called the donor pool um, of other units. Okay, so formally, you know, if you wanted, I mean, I told you this is a way of representing it, but you need to um, estimate those omega i and the way that you do that is minimizing the distance between covariates and the pre-period. So you're going to use the pre-period data and minimize um, basically the distance between the treatment group and the control groups um, values. And kind of the key point here is, is I'm writing X and I know we had X was, I was telling you these are just fixed covariates before, but really the idea is that these X's can include both, you know, that, so think about the, the cigarette example, it can include both um, characteristics of people in the states, like education level, income, et cetera. It can also include lagged characteristics. So lagged amount um, of, uh, what should we call it? Lagged cigarette consumption. And so really what this is doing is if you just think about this panel data, what the weights are doing, the way that the weights are being constructed is to say, all right, we have observed outcomes, which are, you know, the, the treatment groups post and the control groups post. And then we have an, a bunch of observed um, covariates and predictors. So we have the, the treatments pre-group, the control groups um, pre-outcomes, both of those pre-outcomes, and we have their covariates in the pre-period. And really what it's trying to do is it's trying to find weights on the people in the control groups to combine the pre-period outcomes and the control um, the control groups covariates to match as closely it can to the treated one. And it's basically like a regression in the sense it's doing this minimization problem on a lot of covariates and trying to find these weights that are kind of fixed within a given unit to construct a, um, a counterfactual. Um, so this approach can be really successful. It can be really useful. Okay. So this approach can be really useful. I mean, I don't, I have to say that, I don't know, I'd be interested at the end of this when we talk about it, like I, I always find it incredibly magical when these things get shown. So this is the version of that graph I showed you, right? So before, remember when the whole United States was there, it kind of looked like this and then it was kind of not a really compelling counterfactual group. Now we have this dotted line is this quote unquote synthetic California. It was matched based on pre-period characteristics. It kind of perfectly matches in this pre-period. And then we get this divergence where it continues and synthetic California declines as we talked about. And so you get this substantial, um, oops, substantial effect um, 
basically by carefully constructing the synthetic control, you can actually look at what the impact is. And we see that you know the gap in per capita cigarette sales in packs is something like a 20 pack, 25 pack decline in cigarette sales per, per annum, which I think is just like bonkers um, size wise. I mean, I could be wrong. Um, I'm not a health expert on this topic. Um, so, you know, all the same caveats from difference and difference hold here for this to be valid, right? So like, it's not invariant to some transformations, like the choice of outcome was really important here um, for getting this to work well. And the coefficients are gonna, you know, it's, it's not obvious it will inherently look as good as you transform this into a different outcome unit. Um, but what this is doing is it's, um, it's basically constructing a counterfactual. So that's what this, this line is. And then it's taking the relative difference and that's how you're getting each period uh, treatment effect version um, in order to get this value. The inference for this is, I say complex here, but it's, you know, it's really hard to think about what true large sample inference is. So a lot of times, right, we talk about these large sample approximations, but in this setting, you only have a single treated unit it's not even obvious what the asymptotics mean um, in this setting for thinking about it. So a lot of times, at least from an application standpoint, what the what people do is, is basically the placebo method. And so what you do is that for each state, you will um, construct, given that time period, so given the same setting. So if we go back here uh, to here, what you'll do is Rather than looking at California, you'll look at Idaho. You'll construct a synthetic Idaho. You'll take the difference between synthetic Idaho and, and regular Idaho. That'll get you an estimate. You'll do that for all the other 49 states that are in the sample. Or if you have too many, you'll do a random sample. Then what you do is you'll plot those and you can look at the relative distribution of those effects compared to the true one. Um, and so what you'd imagine is by definition, the variance should be smaller for all of them in the pre-period because that's how they're matching. Um, and then the post-period, there's this wide distribution and you're kind of comparing where is the true value relative to these other ones. Um, basically, the analogy here, I haven't dug as deeply as I would like to, um, and I think it's still really being flushed out, to be honest, into how to think about the inference in this setting. The analogy here is to like a randomization inference argument this idea of kind of permuting labels, re-estimating the effect, seeing what the distribution of effects is under this null of there being no effect. I, I think that's still a little bit of a work in progress on, on formalizing this in a way that is satisfactory, um, but intuitively that's kind of the concept here. Um, so I'm going to very briefly touch on this in part because I haven't dug into it as much as I would like and in part because it's still, I mean, I don't, certainly I've never seen a paper, I haven't seen an applied paper use this yet. So we're now at the like, if you use this in your job market paper, you're really, you're pushing, pushing the, the envelope. Um, so um, let me make sure, see if I can pronounce this correctly. So Arkangel, Arkangel, Arkangelski, 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 Arkangelski and, and co-authors. So this is this um, Imbens and Athey, uh so it's Arkangelitsky, uh, Athey, Imbens, and, and a few other um, Stanford GSB folks. They've written down this paper where they're kind of showing that the synthetic methods and more generally these panel methods, what they are are different ways of thinking about matrix completion is the way that they talk about it. And so the idea is, I actually don't put it in the slides, but let me, let me show you on the board. Um, I think this is sort of useful um, to see is that really what you're doing um, when you do these methods is that you have two things going on. You have the treated, um, okay, so let's, let's make sure that we can do this quickly. So there's the pre-period where everyone, there's, the, there's a, a pre-period T, there's N observations. And then in the post period, there is this one treated unit where we observe them treated. There's all these Y zeros. And there's obviously a missing data problem. So, you know, what we need is we need a version. If we think about this as being 
kind of the treated world is that there's this missing data here. And what we have is we have the treated world where we saw just a treated value. And so what we need to do is impute the value here. So there's this missing entry in the control matrix. So this is this whole matrix here where we saw um, these control values in the pre-period, and then this is the post-period. Let me call this pre. And then there's this missing data in this, in this entry. And what we need to do is impute what the values are in this particular entry in order to be able to figure out what the treatment effect is in this group. And the point that they're saying is that what's notable in this setting is that actually things can be very complicated depending on the structure of the problem that you have. So sometimes what you have is many, many units, but very, very few time periods. So you might think about like a micro data set where you only have two time periods. You might also have a very long time series, but um, very few units on either side. So that's, you know, n being very small, um, relative to t is going to make this be kind of a matrix that looks like this versus you could have a very wide matrix or it could be very square. And the idea that they have in this paper is to say, well, all of these are different versions of trying to impute values in a matrix. And that there are basically representations of these matrices where if you're willing to assume that there is a low dimensional representation of this matrix, so they make this factor, if you're willing to basically put this factor structure on the underlying um, matrix representation, that then you can impute the values of it in a, in a basically um, in a relatively robust way, regardless on whether or not you have wide T or you have, or sorry, you have a lot of T and few N or vice versa, or you have a square matrix. It's sort of all these methods kind of work equally well. That's good. So that's kind of the high level. I just wanted to kind of show you graphically part of the intuition here. Really their paper is what they're doing is that they're saying like, look, the synthetic control methods, what they were doing is that given those weights that we chose via that synthetic control method is that they this was doing a version of regression where we were weighting up um, the units and taking the difference between the, um, we were allowing for a constant and then we had some time fixed effect and then we were doing this difference. And so the idea was that we were weighting up different people's time fixed effects in order to get um, an appropriate control group for the treated one. Where, and so that was kind of the goal with the synthetic approach. That's what, part of what they show is that's what synthetic control is doing. Whereas the idea in, um, uh, difference in difference, what difference in difference is doing is instead it's allowing there to be an additive shift term between um, the outcomes of the treated and of any of the units. So they can be additively different from one another. Whereas in the synthetic control, remember that constant was forced to be zero. So you had to be somewhere in the middle between them and you could weight them up. And so what they're proposing, and so this is kind of, the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and write it up so it's a little more clear in the notes and I'll, I'll let you guys know in, in class on Thursday if I've done it yet. But conceptually what they're doing is they're allowing for a version in which they're going to basically relax the parallel trend assumption by requiring parallel trends in this underlying approximate factor structure. So the idea is going to be that there's going to be some additive factor structure that's representative of it, that's time varying, that is going to approximate of like basically a more flexible version of the parallel trends assumption. So if you're someone who's more familiar in the kind of the asset pricing space, in asset pricing, this is this idea that there are underlying factors that are potentially unobservable that are pricing things, and that those things can potentially you know be are weighted combinations of time varying things, and once you condition on those, that basically you know. At, the treatment effect you can kind of estimate by just taking the relative comparison that gives you a, an appropriate counterfactual group. Um, the same idea kind of holds here that there is some unobservable latent factor structure that we're going to use the data to approximate and that by using that that's going to basically um, allow us to estimate this difference in difference effect. We're constructing a synthetic group 
but we're allowing for a more flexible parallel trends. Now, so the reason why there's some appeal to this is that, so you remember when we were talking about difference and difference, I highlighted that we were really leaning on the parametric assumption. So the idea that we could estimate the outcome given, given, that, given that we sort of knew that there, this factor structure of alpha i and gamma t, we imposed this factor, this, um, fa this is a version of a factor model, right? We said there was an additive alpha and an additive gamma that we assume that, and then, then it works. Then we could, so it was potentially testable. We can do some other things. And the concern there, and this came up a little bit with the Roth papers, was that this might not feel super robust. And so, you know, kind of in contrast, in our analysis with Peace Corps methods, we estimated models of the counterfactuals that just use averages of the control uh, outcomes to get an estimate for the counterfactuals. So using covariates to kind of weight up and do these weighted sums, with the understanding that if we got those P scores right, that we would be getting the correct counterfactual. And so obviously this could be biased if the treatment wasn't random. So if we didn't have this random thing, um, it could be biased, but if we had the right P score method, um, we could kind of account for that. And that's what the model is basically trying to account for. So the modeling of either the P score or, or of the underlying factor structure and difference in difference is trying to say, if we get the model right, then um, we're basically going to be accounting for any potential bias differences between the two. And the result in this um, Arkhangelsky um, paper is that the idea is that if either you construct the right synthetic group or you kind of get the right underlying factor structure model, right? If either of those are true, you're going to get the right treatment effect. So what does that mean? It really just means like, you only have to approximately be right. You're gonna be robust to more potential violations in the model. Now, the downside is that, you know, this is a really kind of new and innovative field. So I didn't mean to kind of jump quite so quickly, but here, you know, this is they're arguing that this is one of the benefits of this method is that has this kind of ro double robust feature. And, you know, that sounds cool. It's kind of sounds like, you know, the, it's like microwave pizza. It's like, it's, it's just amazing. It's like pizza, but you can also microwave it. So, I mean, it's just this idea that you can get these improvements on these techniques that potentially given that we have a lot of data and a lot of computing power, we can do um, sort of amazing stuff with it. So now I want to kind of take a step back for a second and talk about the synthetic methods because, and I'm curious if any of you feel this way. I read a lot of these papers in prep for this lecture. And what's kind of remarkable is the number of econometricians who start their paper by saying how burgeoning of a method this is and like how everyone is using it. And I have to be honest that I see almost none of it in applied work, but I don't have the heart to kind of tell the econometricians that people aren't actually using it. Um, I mean, I, I'm being sarcastic when I say that, but I, I, I'm wondering, I, I was thinking to myself and I'd love to know your guys' opinions on sort of what, why is this kind of not? So like, you know, this is kind of an amazing result here. If you look at the synthetic control, being able to construct a synthetic California is kind of a really reasonable way of estimating this effect, but you know, it's not something that re applied researchers seem super gung-ho about using, at least as their main form of estimating something. Um, and it's not obvious to me referees are super gung-ho about having it as the main estimate in the paper. It seems to have relatively strong assumptions. And it's not clear that, you know, going back to that Lee and Donardo paper is that, Donardo and Lee paper is that it's not obvious these are strong structural assumptions that typically you'd hope that these would have kind of testable implications, but it's not obvious to me that we have any good tests of it, at least from what I've seen. And certainly they're not kind of um, part of the toolkit nearly as much. And so, you know, relative to difference in difference, even if you were had these concerns, the assumptions at least feel testable. It's kind of a gut check you can do. Whereas almost by definition, the approach in these synthetic methods is kind of making it look, it's kind of, keying off of these behavioral biases to look at pretrends. 
And so it feels almost as if it's cheating. Um, the researcher degrees of freedom seem multifold. Uh, and by that, I mean, just like, if you dig into it, and I didn't dig into all the pieces, but I'm, I have some references on the next page is that it, there's just a lot of choices, actually, when you end up doing this, how many time periods backwards do you look kind of what do you match on what scaling do you use, how much do you kind of keep tweaking it in order to kind of get the best version of this It happens in difference in difference too, but it's potentially more transparent. And so maybe that's part of the issue. And, you know, of course, the obvious concern is like maybe difference and difference is equally problematic, but we just aren't aware of it because we're so used to it as an approach. But all these kind of new papers are trying to harp on the issue. I don't know. So I want to just pause here for a second. Do you all have opinions on this? Have you seen it? Am I wrong in kind of thinking that this is sort of an obviously um, valuable approach that is being used a lot and I'm just not seeing it? In economic history, you seem to be completely correct. To, uh, Tim, uh, uh, I mentioned this in one of my papers and Tim wrote basically that nobody's really using this because of skepticism essentially is what it sounds like. I don't want to quote him, but that's more or less seems to be. And that's obviously a case where you see a lot of, a lot of diff and diff uh, stuff that's to me at least extremely sketchy where you can drive a truck through the holes and the arguments in these, these papers. Interesting. Oh, that's so interesting. So it's like, so, so maybe then like, let me give the most positive pitch. This comes across as almost too negative here is that there's an element and I have harassed Keto a lot on this. And I think they're working on kind of trying to figure out the best ways to communicate this is that if you can think of good ways to make this come across as kind of really robust and kind of transparent of what are the assumptions going on, I think there's probably tremendous value in that, in that like, you know, given how much these nests different approaches, I mean, they're really not very different from one another, right? I mean, the difference between this and this is the difference between putting some weights, like this is basically some time varying factor weights and some individual, some unit varying factor weights, like, they're data driven, but like, it seems quite plausible. You could think of a lot of good ways to test this either using cross validation or other approaches. It seems hard. These are not so different from one another that it, it seems um, not worth doing. Um, okay, well, I think that's something worth thinking about if there's something you're interested in. I need to play around with it more. I'm sorry, kind of, I don't have a, a deeper sense of it. There's kind of some really interesting papers on this. I think that what I would recommend if this is something you want to explore um, more. Um, Scott Cunningham's book, uh, ha he has a whole chapter on this synthetic control, which you can take a look at, which I think is very good. I would explore the synth and the synth um, DID R packages. And then um, Alberto Abadi has this uh, JEL chapter where he goes through kind of the synthetic control methods and really kind of the nitty gritty of using it. I think he's, that goal was, he was trying to show ways in which to deal with this. But I think like, I, I, I think that there's an inherent point, and I want to try and figure out a way to touch on this more in the future. Um, but it has to come back to this idea of like what your research design is. And so we talked about this in the difference and difference setting and how it's a little bit structural in terms of doing this. And so I think that, you know, it may just be that it feels too much like matching on observables. So we talked about how we kind of don't like matching on observables, right? So we, we, I talked about this here, right? If you rewrite this in a particular way, you're kind of just running a regression where you put a bunch of controls on the right-hand side that include lagged outcomes. And then you're trying to match as close as you can. Well, you have to kind of make a compelling case of why is that any better than just using covariates in the first place. You're presumably missing a lot of things. This is a little bit different because you're using the factor structure in the panel. Um, but I think it's important to kind of make the case of what's the kind of the design or the way that you're kind of getting, you know, um, quote unquote, quasi random intervention. Um, so let me stop there. Um, happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I will see you all on Thursday.